1999, a very popular movie was released to the public called The Matrix. It was a real power at the box office, making an impact on popular culture that continues today, more than a decade later. The Wachowski brothers, who co-wrote and co-directed the movie, had crafted a film that satisfied what a lot of modern moviegoers hunger for, including truckloads of graphic violence that make the film virtually unwatchable for many of us. At the same time, there was one element about the movie that was not quite so modern. The core idea behind its plot, which has been a staple of science fiction for ages, where a hero, an otherwise ordinary fellow, discovers that the world around him, which seems so normal, so pleasantly ordinary, is actually a counterfeit reality, carefully crafted and designed by his enemies to specifically keep him from knowing the shocking truth. The Wachowski brothers would probably be surprised to learn how close their movie was to the truth. Is it possible that you are unknowingly living in a carefully crafted counterfeit reality? And if you were, how would you know? If you want to find out, stay tuned. Greetings and welcome to Tomorrow's World. You know, most people go through their lives without a great deal of reflection or examination. From our political views to our stands on the issues of the day, most people are generally more interested in arguing and proving that they are right and the other guy is wrong than they are in actually examining their beliefs to see if what they believe squares with what is true and right. And that lack of introspection and self-examination extends to our religious beliefs as well. How many people actually, honestly, put the things that they believe about God under the microscope? The things they believe about the universe, about the meaning of life, about right and wrong, good and evil, their religious customs and practices. How often do people simply continue in the things that they were taught as a child or what they heard the convincing man behind the pulpit or for that matter, the fellow they see on TV, without honestly making sure that what they are doing, the things they believe, really are right. That the God they're worshiping truly is the God of the Bible. The Apostle Paul had to press the Christian church of the first century into doing that sort of self-examination. Take a look at what your Bible says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul saw that a different gospel was beginning to take root in the Christian church, a gospel other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look as well at a statement that Paul makes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Did you notice that? Paul was struggling against the spreading of a teaching that involved a different gospel, a different spirit, and a different Jesus Christ. The teachings and customs sounded like the truth. It sounded a great deal like the true Jesus Christ, but it was a counterfeit. While deceptively similar, it was not the truth. The Bible records for us a struggle to maintain the purity of the faith just a few years after the church began. Even in the second to last book of the Bible, we see the struggle continuing. Take a look at the book of Jude in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who were long ago marked out for this condemnation. 
ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Who ultimately was the source of this counterfeit Christianity that was corrupting the young church? Back in 2 Corinthians 11, which we read earlier, Paul discusses the false ministers that had come into the church and who were twisting the true religion that Jesus Christ had left them. He says in verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. It is Satan the devil who was the source of confusion and corruption in the early church. Earlier in the same book, he's called the God of this age or the God of this world. In Ephesians 2 and verse 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air. Jesus Christ himself calls him the father of lies, the enemy, and the ruler of this world. Those who do not believe in a real, literal Satan find themselves in contradiction to the words of the Bible and the clear statements of Jesus Christ. The devil is real, though he would rather you believe that he were not. According to the Apostle Paul, it was Satan the devil who was infiltrating the young church in the first century, deceiving the gullible and presenting a counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit faith, and a counterfeit Jesus Christ. How did this struggle in the first century turn out? Here we are 20 centuries later. Surely everything's turned out well, right? Or has it? We know from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 that Jesus Christ was going to build His church and that He promised that the gates of Hades or the grave would never prevail against it. Much persecuted and maligned and misunderstood, the church founded by Jesus Christ, carrying the message of Jesus Christ, teaching the whole true counsel of God, The true church built by Jesus Christ is prophesied never to perish from the earth and to still be present at His climactic second coming. But honestly, take a look at the mind-numbing variety of beliefs and practices that claim the name Christian in the world today. A bewildering collection if there ever was one. The book of Revelation, considered by some to be the most mysterious book of the Bible, gives us a description of the state of affairs during the end times, the days leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. Read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Now here it's speaking of a war soon to take place in heaven. And it tells us there something very important. The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Satan the devil deceives the whole world. That includes you. That includes me. That includes everyone. Friends, the counterfeiting has never stopped. Satan has not given up in his effort to pawn off a false Christianity, a false gospel, and a false Christ. He still masquerades as an angel of light. He is still the God of this world. He is still the father of lies. Consider this prophecy for the end time, our time in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Here in this description of a great false prophet, the coming Antichrist who will soon be revealed to the entire world, we see that he looks like a lamb. He looks like he represents Jesus Christ. But to those who are discerning, the things that he says, the things that he teaches can be seen to be Satan's counterfeit because he does not sound like the lamb. Rather, he speaks like a dragon. He speaks like that serpent of old, Satan the devil. Having been at work so powerfully for so long and with the whole world pictured as being in its sway at the end times, Let me ask a very difficult question, a question that most honestly will not have the courage to ask. Which do we see on display in modern traditional Christianity today, the real or the counterfeit? Many historians and scholars have already weighed in on that question. Consider this comment from Protestant scholar Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. For 50 years after St. Paul's life, 
a curtain hangs over the church through which we strive vainly to look. And when at last it rises, about 120 A.D., with the writings of the earliest church fathers, we find a church in many aspects very different from that in the days of St. Peter and St. Paul. And Hurlbut's far from alone in this assessment. Which Christianity do we see dominating the scene today? The real Christianity, the Christianity of Peter and Paul, founded on the teachings of Jesus Christ, or the counterfeit Christianity, the clever deception by Satan the devil with a different Jesus, a different gospel, and a different set of teachings based on what Paul calls the mystery of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. Real or counterfeit? And perhaps the key question really is, how can we tell the difference? We will address that question in the second part of our program. But first, let me give you the opportunity to order the free booklet we're making available today entitled Satan's Counterfeit Christianity. Satan is real, and he has a powerful desire to corrupt and distort the true faith of Jesus Christ and the teachings Jesus Christ brought to this earth. The counterfeit he has created to distract the world from the beautiful simplicity of the Bible is laid out for you in detail in this absolutely free booklet. Call the number on the screen today to order the copy that we have waiting for you. No one will call or contact you, and no one's going to ask you for a donation. Call or write today and ask for this powerful free booklet on Satan's counterfeit Christianity. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-718-4800. That number, once again, is 1-800-718-4800. Call now or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World. Call now. Welcome back. Is it really possible that the counterfeit Christianity that was invading the early church like a virus in the first century could still be present in the 21st century? In Luke chapter 12 and verse 32, Christ refers to his true followers as a little flock. Is it possible that the counterfeit is more than simply present? Could it actually be dominant? Is it possible that the counterfeit has in actuality, in large part, replaced the reality? As we concluded our last segment, the crucial question really is this. How would we know? How can we tell if the faith that we follow is the truth or the counterfeit? Well, in an effort to identify a counterfeit faith, we can take our cue from the Treasury Department and its fight against counterfeit money. Consider a $20 bill. One of the chief and most fundamental ways to recognize a counterfeit is to be completely and intimately familiar with the real thing. When you know how a real $20 bill feels in your fingers, the weight of its paper in your hands, the way the paper responds when you fold it, when you look up close and you see the details and the fibers embedded in the material. And you take a look at how the ink bleeds or doesn't bleed into the paper. All the intricate and hard to pick out details that are in the pictures, even, even the way it smells, the more deeply and intimately familiar you are with a true $20 bill, then the more capable you are of recognizing when you've been handed a counterfeit. Even the subtle differences that others would not notice stand out to you like night stands out from day. And when you become thoroughly familiar with the true standard, it's easy to identify the false. The solution is no different in spotting a counterfeit faith, a counterfeit Christ, or a counterfeit Christianity. Become so familiar with the true standard that the counterfeit cannot help but stand out for its differences, no matter how subtle. 
What is that standard? God's holy word. Look at the example of the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. If you're one of our many frequent visitors here on Tomorrow's World, then you are familiar with the fact that we stress on this program, we do not want you to take our word for it. Don't believe me. Believe your Bible. Very frankly, my friends, too many people simply believe the guy behind the pulpit without checking up on him. Or for that matter, they simply take the word of the guy they see on TV. I am telling you, Check up on me. Read the things that we're saying in your own Bible. Check up on us, but check up on the other guys too. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21 tells us to prove all things and to hold fast that which is true. Let's take a look at some aspects of traditional Christianity and then give them the $20 bill test. Let's compare them to the Word of God and see how they measure up. For instance, let's consider the reward of the saved. Many churches teach that when you die, you go to heaven. Uh, For some, that means floating off into the clouds with a harp in your hand. Uh, For others, it's some idealized version of life on earth today. Some have even described heaven as some sort of beatific vision where you simply gaze at the face of God in joy for all eternity. But what does the Bible say about the reward of the saved? Well, in the passage of Scripture known as the Beatitudes, Jesus teaches us something important. Look here in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Later in the book of Revelation, it says explicitly in chapters 5 and verse 10 that Christ will make us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Later still in chapter 20 and verse 6, we're told the saints will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Is this just some sort of symbolic language or some metaphor that we can just rationalize or ignore? The apostle Paul didn't think so. Look at what he says to those in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? In these places and many others in the Bible, the Bible says that the reward of the saved is to literally rule alongside Jesus Christ in power and glory. Is that what you hear being preached today in most churches that profess Christianity? The pure word of God gives us a rock solid standard that allows us to identify the counterfeit of Satan the devil. Let's look at another aspect of modern Christianity. It's traditional celebrations. Many people agree with the song that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Exchanging gifts, decorating their Christmas trees, lighting their Yule logs, traditions that have been enjoyed for generations and celebrated in the name of Christ. Or Easter with its popular bunny, Easter eggs and hot cross buns. Again, traditions that have been part of professing Christianity for centuries. Yet any encyclopedia worth reading will clearly explain the origins of these traditions and practices and that they lie in pagan worship customs that predate Christianity by centuries, even millennia in some cases. How does God feel about the use of pagan practices to worship Him and His Son? In the Old Testament, God made His feelings on the matter very clear. At the end of Deuteronomy chapter 12, he clearly commands that the practices of pagans are not to be used in worship, even if the worship is directed toward God. But what is the teaching of Jesus Christ on the matter of tradition versus commandment? 
it is his teaching that we should expect the true church that he founded and not the counterfeit to be practicing. On this matter, Jesus Christ is absolutely clear. He says to the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7 and verse 9, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Christ condemned the practice of ignoring the commandments of Almighty God in order to keep traditions that break those commandments. Friends, this is only the tip of the iceberg, but it will benefit you so much more if you were to open your own Bible and see these things for yourself. If you really are interested in worshiping Jesus Christ and God the Father in spirit and in truth, as we're told in John 4 and verse 24, then call us today and order our free booklet, Satan's Counterfeit Christianity. This unique booklet, which powerfully exposes the subtle deception that Satan the devil has foisted on humanity, order this free booklet, get out your Bible, and start experiencing the joy that can only come from the true and pure faith of Christ, a joy that Satan's counterfeit simply cannot provide. We've got a free copy waiting for you. Get yours today. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-718-4800. That number once again is 1-800-718-4800. Call now. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World. Call now. Friends, we started off this program with the comment that a number of science fiction movies use the plot device of a hero who discovers that the world around him is not as it seems, that it's a cunning deception, a counterfeit reality that has been designed to keep him from knowing the truth. In those science fiction plots, it's not unusual for a moment to come in the story in which the hero begins to learn the truth and then has a very difficult decision to make. Do I go back to the comfortable world I've always known, even though I know it is a lie, or do I bravely take the next step and fully embrace the truth, regardless of how uncomfortable that decision may seem? As you look into the true Christianity of the Bible versus the Christianity that is practiced all around us, you may come to such a moment yourself. And you're not alone. I know that feeling. I've been there myself. I know what it's like. On one hand, there's a real joy as you learn things you've never learned before. And the Bible begins to make sense in some ways for the very first time ever. Some passage of Scripture that you've read over and over before but have never fully understood might come to life all of a sudden and make perfect sense and fit into a larger picture. In fact, you start reading some parts of the Bible that you didn't even know were there or that you didn't pay any attention to before, and you begin to see what a marvelous book the whole Bible is, how the fullness of God's complete revelation is powerful, dynamic, and truly life-changing. How one truly can tremble before the Word of God, as Isaiah 66, 2 tells us. There's an exhilaration as you begin to uncover the true Christianity of the Bible and begin to shed and lay aside all the baggage you've been carrying around about what the Bible is supposed to say as opposed to what it actually does say. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33, We are told that God is not the author of confusion. But then if you look out into the confusing babel of uh, traditional Christianity, with its hundreds, if not thousands, of differing groups and denominations, there's a powerful sensation of peace that comes with discovering why that is so and what true Christianity really is. On the other hand, there can be a bit of an anxious feeling as well 
as you begin to wonder if you really have the courage to act on what you're learning. Perhaps wondering where the road will end once you start. Actually, perhaps you wonder if you're alone in pursuing true Christianity over the counterfeit. In this, again, we can turn to Jesus Christ's promise in Matthew 16 and verse 18 that He would build His church and that the grave would never prevail against it. It would stand throughout time and would be present at His second coming, waiting for the day when it will be presented to Him as a bride who has made herself ready. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul refers to the church, the true church, not the counterfeit, the church founded by Jesus Christ and called it the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Elsewhere in John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus says, You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It does take courage to abandon a comfortable lie and to begin reaching for the truth. I know it does. But somewhere, like a small but beautiful and precious gemstone amongst a pile of counterfeits, is a church that actually teaches the truth of Jesus Christ, the very same message and way of life that He brought to this earth, a church that actually teaches and lives and practices the Christianity of Christ Himself and the Christianity of the original apostles. How important is it to you to find that church? And how willing are you to let go of the counterfeit once you do? I can't encourage you enough to call today and take advantage of our absolutely free offer of our powerful booklet, Satan's Counterfeit Christianity, which will help you study your own Bible to expose the powerful deception that Satan has woven into the fabric of the world around us. And I encourage you as well to tune in each week to Tomorrow's World. Roderick Meredith and Richard Ames will continue to show you the truth of God from your own Bible about the world we now live in as well as the world that thankfully God is bringing. See you right here next week. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-718-4800. That number once again is 1-800-718-4800. Call now or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. To view today's program, order the free literature offered, or for more information on today's vital subject, visit us online at www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God. 